Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This morning, we're going to talk about awakening the Holy Spirit within us. I want to talk about it because I, I really want this year to be different. I want it to be different in your spiritual life. I want it to be different in your physical body. I want it to be different in your financial life. I want God to be God in our lives. Amen? Now, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do this without making people uncomfortable. <laughs> well, you don't know what I was going to say, but here. I am. Amen. Oh, Ooh, the Holy Spirit is so cool. Because I'm going to talk about, that's what I was afraid of making people uncomfortable with, but that's all right. I like that. She said it, and we didn't talk. So I want you to understand that. Um, but there's also two others, and these are very easy to remember. That's why there's not sheets. If you really don't have time or you struggle with reading, um, read the book of John, one chapter a day. 21 chapters, not hard at all. If you're, you think the whole New Testament is a little difficult, read Romans to Jude. That's 21 books. And you can divide it up by reading approximately, uh, I think it's 13 chapters a day. And it just gives you a nice time. Now what I was afraid would make people uncomfortable is if you're in the fast and you'd like someone to, for lack of a better, be a prayer partner, I'm going to just raise your hand. Um, and I'm going to tell you to do it in a minute if you'd like that. And if you don't, don't worry about it, but raise your hand. And then somebody who wants to be a prayer partner, look at, find somebody who raised their hand and go talk to them after service. Are you ready? If you're interested in that, raise your hand. Okay, that was easy. And the reason I say that is because it's important that we, we do that. It's important that we gather together, that we encourage one another. Um, and there's also something else. How many, of you, how many of you have ever gone to the gym? How many of you know that you're far more successful if you have someone going with you? You get up, you meet them because there's a, a level of commitment to one another. And so we're committing this time to the Lord but it's just a tremendous thing if we pray. Like, as my daughter said, if you read something, you can just call. Today, I like the way she says it, call, text, Facebook, do whatever you want to do, and say, you know, I, I was reading this, and you were reading it. Did you get this feeling? Did you get this when, I, when, when you read it? Because I want to know. And if as an individual you don't feel you can fast uh, food, uh, we talked about fasting media. We talked about giving time to God. Whatever it is that you're fasting, give it to the Lord and, and take that time and spend it in prayer. And my goal for this is two things. Um, the purpose, the main purpose of fasting is to get closer to God, to, to know him like you've never known him before. And there's something that comes when we deny ourselves either food or some pleasure or something we really enjoy. And each time, I use food because really every time I feel a hunger pain or every time I desire, this year I'm not watching television, but, and every time, normal years when I watch TV, every time I see a, a food commercial, how many of you know if you're fasting, 
you notice all the food commercials. And now if you're fasting, if you're Daniel fasting and you're like Bill and I and you love meat, every single commercial that comes up is meat. It just is, right? Absolutely. Oh. I remember one year, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken came up with these hot wings that were dry hot wings. So for 40 days, I have to watch this commercial, and my mouth is just watering for these hot wings. So the first thing I do, I wouldn't suggest this just to anybody who doesn't fast regularly. The first thing I do the day after my fast is I run to Kentucky Fried Chicken, I order these hot wings, and they were the most disappointing thing I've ever eaten. <laughs> because it, it was just there. But the point is that if you see it, but every time you see the hot wing, every time you see the pizza, every time you see the, the, the restaurant that serves steak or whatever it is, and you go, oh, I'm not eating. That's a prayer to God. Fasting is a silent prayer, continual prayer to God, 24-7. Now, uh, my, my daughters, they have issues, health issues, and so I ask them not to fast, but they've chosen to give up their favorite thing. They've chosen to give up. Uh, uh oh, what's that called? Etsy? No. Pinterest. Couple hours a day. Tumblr. Okay, Tumblr. So give up some of the things they want, and that two hours, a, that couple hours a day that she had wants to honor God with, she's going to spend time in the Word and in supplication and in prayer, which is just, I think, will make a tremendous difference. I say all that because I want things to be different for you this year. Now, I, w I can honestly say um, things are different for me almost every year, almost every year. Um, but whether it's in my physical body, I'm healthier every year, which is kind of weird, you know? I, I get, how many of you know we get older every year, right? Um, most people, as they get older, their health deteriorates. Right. I'm like wine or cheese. I get better as I get older. I don't know what it's all about. The only thing that doesn't get better is I can't, hand, I can't get a handle on this. I'm praying that this year is the year that uh, I get a handle on that. But I have, my, if my wife was in the room, she would testify to the fact I'm healthier at 55 than I was at 25. And I simply believe it's because I honor God first. And I, I do what he says. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest. Some of the things he told me to do were eat better. You know, quit eating. Uh, when I was 25, breakfast, I mean, I mean, how do I explain it? Oh, Pastor Gail used to say it this way. I eat cheese on my cheese. Okay? It was just everything. Everything had cheese. And when we say cheese, I, see, let me give you an example. When you put cheese on your pasta, you go like this, right? Well, I probably go like this. And I mix it all up and do it again. <laughs> and that's exactly what she meant. And God taught me that I had to do some things a little bit different. And so even in terms of my physical body, allergies and all that stuff, they're much better. I say all that because we need to give God first. But I want you to understand something. Those are all, listen to me, those are all byproducts of being in tune with the Holy Spirit and giving God your life first. They're all byproducts. They, they happen, and I want you to understand something. They happen without you doing anything except listening, except obeying, and expect, except communicating with the Holy Spirit. And what I want to talk about this morning is how you and I need to encounter the Holy Spirit this year as you have never encountered it before. Whether you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, whether you've been slain in the Spirit, danced on, on water, I don't care what it is you've ever done, God wants a continuing, a continuing filling of his Holy Spirit in our life. I want you to understand something. How many of you know you can be full to overflowing? Amen, right? We have the Spirit with us. How many of you know that you're not supposed to stay that way? If you're full up to here with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, with the wisdom and knowledge of God, and your heart has been changed and renewed, you're not supposed to stay full. You're supposed to empty it out to everybody you meet. People are... Uh, uh, I was just listen, listening to a book by Dallas, Dallas Willard. Fabulous, fabulous. Brilliant, brilliant man. And... Christendom, being a Christian, 
has been corrupted. Let's just use that word. Because we have turned it into, all you have to do is know Jesus, have faith, and you're going to heaven. And you know, that there's, there's a level of truth to, there, to that. But nowhere in Scripture does Jesus, the apostles, ever preach that what you need to do is get the minimum requirement not to go to the bad place. It's just not in there. When Jesus would listen to this, when Jesus was asked the question, what's the most important? He said, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And then there's a little word. Where are the teachers in the room? Only one? It says two. It says and. Uh-oh. What does that mean? What does that mean, and? It's inclusive. It's not an option. It's not a choice. It's and. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I want you to understand something. In, according to Jesus, it's not enough just to love God. I've got to love my neighbor as myself. And if you read the story of the Good Samaritan, who's your neighbor? Everybody you meet. Oh, my God, that's got to be awful. And it is. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. You cannot succeed at it on your own. But if you've encountered the Holy Spirit of God, you can. As we share the next few weeks, the purpose of this time, these, this series of messages is that you and I come to a deeper a more powerful, intimate contact with Almighty God. And I'm not talking about, I hate to say it this way, but I'm, gonna, I'm, not gonna, I'm not talking about the kind of whirlwind thing that happens when you go to camp. I'm not talking about the wonderful touch you feel when you go to a women's conference. I don't know what men really do, so, you know, it's just, it, I'm not talking about those. Guys, I say go to, go to a men's conference and it's how to be a man, you know. But I'm not talking about any of those things. I am talking about a life-changing, lifelong relationship that moves you to the very core of your being, the very essence of who you are. Over the years, I've seen how this kind of experience changes people. And it doesn't matter what name you put before yourself, Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Baptist, Fundamentalist, Liberal, it doesn't matter. Every imaginable faith tradition, once they encounter Jesus Christ, their prayer life changes. They experience newfound joy. They have power over sin. They, have a, they feel a new level of closeness to God that they've never felt before. Doing that, but that's okay. This wants to give me a hard time. John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Counselor. 14, 27, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. After the resurrection, in Acts 1, 8, he said, after that, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you shall receive power. That word there is dunamis, but let me finish. Power, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And I want you to understand something. The reason, maybe, we need to consider the reason that we are not witnesses, we are not affecting our workplace, our schools, our communities, is because we are not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand why I say that. What I mean, I have taken Evangelism Explosion, Billy Graham's this. I've taken ABCs of, of, of salvation. But I have to tell you, nothing will change a heart like the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not about knowledge. It's about relationship. It's not about who or what people say. And we have de 
demeaned the power of the gospel to pray this little prayer and you'll make it to heaven. I want you to understand something. There's a level of truth to that, but that is not the end. Jesus, when he gave the great commission, said, all power and authority has been given unto me. I give it to you. Go ye therefore into all the world and make converts. Oh, good, thank you. No. Make disciples. And I want you to understand something. A disciple. How many of you know what the word disciple means? Studier, learner. The only way to make a disciple is to spend time with them, pouring over the Word of God, changing them, changing them. And I want you to understand, when I talk about this, I want us to understand a disciple is one who allows the process of spiritual format. This isn't even my message. I'm in trouble. <laughs> The power of spiritual formation to take root in their life. And I want you to understand what spiritual formation is. And spiritual formation is the process by which the Holy Spirit changes us, transforms us, mind, soul, and spirit, body as well transforms us. Now, I want you to understand something. What has happened is this. We have replaced spiritual formation with a very good word, compliance to a bunch of rules. Spiritual modification, I'm sorry, spiritual formation, the transformation that Paul talks about in Romans is not behavior modification. It's not deciding I'm not going to do all these things. Spiritual formation is when you allow God through your intimate relationship with him to change you on the inside. And what do I mean when I say that? Well, there are a lot of times people in my life have asked me this question. Well, why do you do that? And my response is always the same. Because it's the right thing to do. What else would I do? You don't think about anything else. It's the right thing to do. And so what's happened is it's changed on the inside. My daughter said something as an illustration yesterday that I didn't, I didn't even know I would be able to use it, but I'm going to. Um, we were at Home Depot. My wife needed a couple of new cabinets for the kitchen. And so I said, yeah, okay, let's go. And so we went and bought the cabinets. And in the process of getting the cabinets, I love my wife dearly, but she, she, she I, I don't want to offend her. Her driving is a little, uh, and like I tell you, driving a cart with two cabinets on it, heavy cabinets on it, is not any better. So she rolls over my foot, and I go, Ugh! and I, whatever I said, I did. And my daughter said, I can't believe it. You didn't even think a swear word. I said, what do you mean? She goes, oh, no, I can tell when people are thinking what they want to say. <laughs> and it's true. I, it doesn't think it. Why? Because it's not in there. Scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And I'm sorry. I remember years ago I counseled someone who, who went off on their husband. And, and I mean, this was a, a, a Christian woman who sounded like the most ungodly truck driver you've ever met. Okay. And when I called her on it, this was what she said. That's not who I am. I was having a bad day. And I said, now, my response to those things are never, don't, I, I don't want to judge you, I don't want to do anything. What does Scripture say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If it wasn't in there, it couldn't come out. And the response was, now this is, just blew me away. I just stopped talking. No, that's not who I am. That's not true. And I said, I'm going to tell you something right now. The moment you disallow the word of God, when you say it's not accurate and true, I'm done. That's the final authority. That's God saying, if it's in there, it's going to come out. 
So why am I saying that? Because I want you and I to be changed from the inside out this year like we've never been changed before. I want this year. How many want this year to be better than last year? I'm going to give you the best advice in the world. Raise your hand. Keep them up. How many want this year to be better than last year? I'm going to give you the best advice in the world, and it comes from Albert Einstein. Insanity. He called the definition of insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. A different result. That's right. A different result. And what we do, as Christians, we do it all the time. The pastor goes up there. He's going to pray. and He's going to fast. and He's going to do this. And that's not for me. He's a little extreme. I, I don't have any money to give, so I can't give it. Dorothy talked about the lady who went up for a, a shekel offering. I want you to understand, her first fruits offering was five shekels or whatever it was. What that comes out to is 40 or $50. It wasn't like she gave $10,000 as the first fruits offering. And God's going to bless her because of it. We need to understand that if we want things to be different this year, we need to do things differently. Make sense? So that's why I suggest that every year we begin with this time with God, this time of being intimate. Let me read Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. It says, when the apostles were in Jerusalem and Samaria, they heard that some in Samaria had accepted the word. They sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. And they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter's hand placed his hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I'm going to talk to you about all kinds of stuff here, but I'm going to make it real simple. You ready? Very, very simple. Peter prayed. He laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. In this particular context, it meant they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. That is a charismatic, a, a Pentecostal experience. And I want you to understand, if you don't do it, it's time in your life you decide to do it. Well, it doesn't fit my theology. Okay. If every year is getting better for you, then don't worry about it. If it's not, it's time to change that. And it begins there. And I want you to understand. Now, listen to me. Well, I, I, I began the service by talking about the fact that we are filled to overflowing to give out. So what happens? If your gas tank is on half empty and you don't put any more gas in it, what do you think is going to happen sooner or later? The car will stop. And how do you get the car going again? More gas. So the truth of the matter is, you and I need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit our, quote, gas to be successful in his life, the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of power. He says he'll guide us, our, our, our tour guide for this life's journey. And how do we do that? By spending time, by encountering. Paul says that I speak in tongues more than you all. I wish you would all do it. But there are things that have to happen when we understand that. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's really simple. Are you ready? I'm going to give you. There are places where they teach you you need to go to these classes, spirit life or spirit-filled seminars, and, or you got to do this or you got to do that. I'm going to tell you, listen to me, God has promised to give you the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say you have to clean up your act, shave, get to put a tie on, you know, give all your money. I want you to understand how many in the room know what the one requirement for the Holy Spirit is in your life. Say it again, nice and loud. Ask, how much easier can it get? You mean I don't have to, you have to ask? And listen, these people, these people asked, and Peter went, you want it? Oh, yes, Jesus' name, you got it. Hallelujah. They all spoke in tongues, and their lives were changed. But I want you to understand, also other things that happen here is When you do that, this is the apostles were filled as well. Well, didn't they receive? Yeah, they received the Holy Spirit when Jesus told them he would get it in, in, in the Gospels. 
They were filled again in Acts chapter 1. They were filled again in Acts chapter 4. They were filled again here in Acts chapter 8 because they're giving what they have out so that they can completely and continue to be refilled and refreshed. Now, I want to do the first one. Okay, well, that's all right. <laughs> Just go to one. The first thing that happens... I want you to understand something. What, the reason you get filled with the Holy Spirit is because you're yielding more of yourself to God. See, I don't want to split theological hears. We all, we all get the Holy Spirit when we're saved. Yes, we do. All of him. Scripture says we receive it without measure. But it's like... Having about, it's like winning the Powerball. $990 million. And sticking all the money in your mattress and still living in that little shack that you spent your life with. You can have all the money and all the power in the world until you use it. It's useless to you. The Holy Spirit came into our lives, forgave us our sins. Our old sinful nature is buried. With a new, we became a new creation. That work is complete. But when you ask to be with the Holy Spirit, you filled with the Holy Spirit, you are not receiving anything more from God. You are yielding more of yourself to God and being filled in the process. It's giving more of yourself. John the Baptist said it this way, I must decrease, he must increase. And when that happens in our lives, we will walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We will see knowledge, wisdom, understanding, discernment, truth, provision, all the things that God has promised us are ours. We need to understand we are, I believe, the Trinitarian view. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to walk in that truth that we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when we commune with the Holy Spirit, we are communing with God the Father and God the Son. God the Son, the creator of it all. Everything was created by him, for him. And he said, I've given it to you. You have the same inheritance that Jesus Christ has. And we need to move beyond where we are. We need to yield more of ourselves to him. When we ask to be filled, he will meet us and we surrender more and more of ourselves to him. I like this one. I thought this was cute. So, number two. How many have ever, I, no, don't admit it if you ever have, but how many have ever been stopped and you've got a DUI? And if you haven't been stopped, you know somebody who has. And you know what it is? It's driving under the influence. Well, have you ever been, have you ever seen anybody drunk? You know what under the influence means. The guy who's shy starts flirting with everybody. You know, gets up on the table and dances. Not very well. Falls a few times, but he does it. The guy who doesn't talk and really doesn't know anything, all of a sudden is the smartest man on the planet. He can give you, he can tell you anything you need to know, how to live your life, how to do it, how to invest your money. He's got nothing, but he can tell you how to do it. Their behavior changes. And when it comes to driving, we understand. We get them behind the car. They could have a perfect driving record behind the car. Behind, behind the wheel of a car, they're a hazard to himself. They're a hazard to property. They're a hazard to other people. It's driving under the influence. When we... Allow ourselves to be filled to overflowing. Not a one-time thing, a continual experience, which is the next thing I want to talk about. But I, we are now L-U-I. You ready? I want you to learn what that means. I want you to be L-U-I, living under the influence. Living under the influence of the Almighty God. Living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And I, what that does is it changes you on the inside. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. You say the right thing because it's the only thing you think of. You do the right thing because it's the only thing you think of. Now, there are times in my life where even now I'll, I'll struggle with doing the right thing. I immediately know what the right thing is to do. The person or people or situation I'm in doesn't deserve the right thing. They just don't deserve it. But I want you to understand something. That's not my choice. 
God has said you do the right thing for the right reason out of your heart and I will bless you. It doesn't matter how miserable, how bad, how wrong, how unrighteous they are. What if they're a liar and a thief and they say bad things about me? Pray for those that despitefully use you. Do good to them who curse you. Uh Uh-oh. That comes from the heart. Because you know what? You can't bite your tongue and do that. Because you'll bite the stinking thing off. It comes from the heart. You have to believe in your heart. And I want you to understand something. This particular generation, and I feel bad. I mean, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit part of it, but I grew up in a generation where we understood the power of things in our lives. We understood God. We, understood, we saw the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We walked in those things. Every time the church door was open, we went. My kids, my, my kids slept in the nursery, slept on the pews. We went to church four or five times a week. We had special services. We had prayer. Something was up. My, my kids, oh, oh, the big service tonight, huh? Yep. All right. They get their own sleeping bag. What are they called? puff lump They had this big pillow that they stuffed their clothes in, uh, looked like an elephant or something. My, my Christina had a sleeping bag that she slept with in her bed, in her crib, and everywhere we went so that she had something familiar. What are you doing? Go lay down. But, 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 hey, look, i got to tell you, but we're in church, and I, that's right. Well, you let them sleep. Look, there's no better place. They're going to sleep. Let them sleep in the anointing. I'm not going to stay home with them. Nowadays, oh, they get school tomorrow. I don't want to look bad. Education is important. I don't mean to sound funny, but I did it with my girls, and they both graduated. Loud or something. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. What? And Mandy's got an over 3.5 or something, 3.0. Very good in school. She's doing great as well, even with a disability. And so I just look at it and say, why? It didn't hurt them at all. Now, I did have to modify things a little bit because every Thursday morning they said my kids were sleepy. We had church on Wednesday night then. So I I decided, okay, well... um, I'll end service at 8.30 because they're up that late anyway. So at 8.30, my wife would take the kids home or Pastor Gail would take the kids home. They'd all go to bed. So I had to modify it a little bit. But they were always in God's presence because that's what it was. Nowadays, we got every reason not to. Oh, they got school plays. They got this and that. I, I, was, I was really disappointed. My daughter, Mandy, didn't do stuff when she was in college or even high school. She says, it's on Thursday night. There's no option. May, actually, the same thing. I won't do it. I, they fight. They have to take a class on Thursday night. Mandy has to take a class on Thursday night. Now, listen to this. I want you to understand what her, where her heart is. It's in there. It's in there. She has to be at school from 4.30 to 6.30. She says, Daddy, I might be a couple of minutes late, but you know I'll be there. Same thing with, with Ashley. I might be late, but you know I'll be there. Why? Because they understand that it, when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord, I was glad. It's in their hearts. And there are many people like that. But we need to understand that's where we need to be. Fellowship, communion, the word to change us, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to live under the influence. It leads us to, it allows us to speak the right words at the right time and allows God to work through you. I love the illustration of um, Melissa. Melissa, this morning, God gave a dream the night before that someone's going to be shot. Now, did she not get out in the car? Did she stay home? No, no, no. She just listened to it, put it in her heart. When she heard something that could have been a gunshot, she exercised wisdom. Let's just sit in the car for a few minutes. And she saved her children the trauma of seeing someone shot and that whole experience. Why? Because she was listening to the Holy Spirit. Not only will he give you the right thing to say at the right moment, He'll give you what you need to know in every situation because he knows the beginning from the end. He'll not only tell you, he'll tell you how to behave, what to do, what not to do, where not to go. I can't tell you the number of times we have in our lives not done something that everyone thought we should do because the Holy Spirit said no. Uh, Chuck was sharing with me when he was younger. He had a job offer. And with five kids, 
or six kids and a wife, a job offer for more money, really, a lot more money, really sounds like a good idea. So his wife and he prayed about it. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't give him peace. He didn't say, take the job. So he didn't. How many of you would do that? How many would be in so in tune with the Holy Spirit that, the first, you know the first thing we would say if someone offered us a job for 50% more or twice as much money? Glory to God, Jehovah Jireh. Yes, 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 got to be God. That doesn't happen. Well, he prayed about it, and he didn't take the job. And three months later, the place closed down. They, nobody could collect. The pension, everything was gone. He would have been out of work, out of a job, and I'm sure the old company would have brought him back. And six kids and a wife would have been allowed out without an income. But it was more money. It sounded so good. It had to be God. That's why we need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. I guess it doesn't fit on this belt. But it's simple enough that he listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he saved himself heartache, disappointment, and struggle. How many would do that if God tells you no? But you know how you know that is because you're in that place where you commune with him regularly and he says no. I've done it driving, going places, doing things. God says to go another way, and I do it. God tells me, don't let your kid do this. And my children are so much older now, I don't want to bring examples that are 30 years old, but don't get in the car with them. Oh, I'll never forget it. It's vivid in my mind. My daughter did it, begged me to get in the car, and I, I felt no peace about it at all. My daughter was so mad at me. Oh, my God. If she could have killed me, she might have. 30 minutes later, she came down from her bedroom crying because they got in a severe accident. If I had told her something's going to happen, she would have called me weird, freaky, out of the world. But something happened. I didn't feel peace about it. I will tell you a very valuable lesson, though, that happened there. From that point on, if my wife or I said, we don't have peace, she'd go, oh, I'm not going. <laughs> Doesn't take much to learn it, you know? Anyway, number three, it's a continual, continual experience. It's not a one-time deal. It's an ongoing fulfillment. We are constantly filled and refilled. We must awaken the spirit within us and carry it with us every moment. Now, here's the thing. I want you to understand something. This is a lie in the church. Are you ready? This is a big lie. That there's a difference between secular and sacred. What makes something secular? The absence of God. What makes it sacred? You take that presence with you everywhere. Whatever you do is sacred is holy. We, this idea that I'll behave one way here and one way there and I'm in the world and you don't understand, I'm in college. I gotta tell you, that's all trash. Because if we can, the enemy can cause us to think in such a way that some things aren't meant to be sacred, some things aren't meant to be holy, we can't do that, we can't act that way because we won't, then God has failed. And we are impotent. But if you know that everywhere you go, your presence makes it sacred. The presence of the Holy Spirit in you makes it sacred. Not what's going on. Not the situation. Then you need to know that it's different. But we bought the lie that some things just not, that we don't, the old adage, you know, he goes where angels fear to tread. Why well, angels might fear to tread it, but God, the Holy Spirit's here. God with us. We need to understand that. There is no difference. 
knowledge. There's not secular and secular. It's either truth or it's not. I read a great illustration recently. And it comes down to wh where you stand. If I was to ask Carlos, I don't know, Carlos, maybe he doesn't. Um, if I was to ask Joe, because I know he's not really comfortable with this, to go up on a ladder and walk along the roof and then just step off, do you think he would do it? How come? You don't think he'd go up the ladder, but let's not go there. Let's say he went up the ladder, he's walking along the f a nice flat roof. I said, Joe, just step down, don't worry about it. How many think he would step down? How many in the room would step down? Why? What? Why? Oh, gravity. Oh, you mean you believe in gravity? Oh, see, that's the way it is. God is just that real. Nobody's going to step off, of, off the roof because gravity is going to bring them down pretty fast. God is that real, and that's what we need to have in our lives where we know that God is as real as gravity. And that only happens when you encounter the Holy Spirit and allow him to permeate your heart, mind, soul, and body. That's how we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's how it happens. Not by a willful adherence to some standard. How it happens is out of an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And here's the wonderful thing about that. Going back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. After that, the Holy, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you shall receive dunamis. Now, you know what's so wonderful about that word dunamis? Anybody? What's wonderful about the word dunamis? It means power, but what kind of power? That's good. It's supernatural. God breathes power. Why is that so important? Anybody ever try to go on a diet? Quit cigarette smoking? Quit drinking? Quit lying? Quit speeding, quit this, quit that. It doesn't, anybody ever tried to do it in their own strength? One in ten are successful. One in ten have the willpower and the volition to push down their flesh. But see, dunamis means super natural power. It's God's nuclear power, unending, lasts forever, and will give you the strength and the ability to do anything he's called you to do and anything that come, you come face to face with without compromising your faith. Wow. How many want that? I know I do. Let's all stand this morning. Take a moment and close your eyes. Take a moment. Think about the dunamis, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Victory over sin sickness, mindsets, addictions, family iniquities, victory, supernatural power. Think about it for a moment. How much how strongly do you want it? Now raise your hands. 
Pray these words with me. Come, Holy Spirit, according to your word, I ask, fill me to overflowing. Give me the Holy Spirit of promise. Fill me to overflowing. Give me the Spirit without measure. I just reach up to the Lord. Reach up to the Lord. Lord, we ask right now that every voice, every heart that is asked for a greater touch, a, a, a greater infilling, Lord, that you would speak to them right now.
Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need. Lord, fill us to overflowing. Be filled with his spirit this morning. Leave here different. I'm going to close in prayer, but I'm going to say this just this way. If you're not done, don't leave. Just lift your hands to the Lord and receive from him. God wants us to be filled to overflowing, to be transformed from the very core of our existence. And that only happens when we encounter the Holy Spirit, when we awaken the Holy Spirit within us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence here this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would touch each and every person supernaturally. Change us from the very core of our being. Change us from glory to glory. Let us be filled to overflowing by your Holy Spirit. Give each person here a special, a significant encounter this morning that they might know they have met with you. And I ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.